Hello everyone and welcome. Today I am extremely excited because we are looking at one of the Gnostic Gospels, the Secret Book of John, the Secret Gospel of John. And this is considered one of the largest blasphemies, the largest heresies by the church. Now, if you don't know what Gnosticism is, I will be putting a link in the description of this video where you can see a quick synopsis and overview of what Gnosticism is that I created. So again, if you're new, you don't know what it is, check that out. But in a nutshell, what Gnosticism is, and particularly the secret gospel of John, is a heretical, a heretical and blasphemous version of Christianity that says that the God of the Bible isn't God at all, but actually a demonic devil named Yaldabaoth, who creates the material world as a prison and traps souls into matter to power his infernal creation. And so basically what the Gnostics believed was that you were a higher God than the God of the Bible. But the God of the Bible is actually a demonic being that took the essence of that God and trapped it into matter. And so we are all pieces and fragmentary shards of the divine, but we've been trapped in matter. And now it's our goal to achieve gnosis and gnosis derives from the Greek word for knowledge, knowledge of what we are to realize our own divinity and transcend the material realm. So, of course, this was very heretical, very blasphemous by, you know, because of the church. Uh, they, uh, you know, St. Uh, Irenaeus wrote a book called Adversus Heresis, or Against Heresies, condemning them, trying to stamp them out, and they were uh, attacked Throughout history, their books were burned, destroyed, and they were actually buried uh, for 1,600 years until they were discovered, not until 1945. 1945, in a graveyard near the tombs of Egypt. They were dug up. This is now called, known as the Nag Hammadi Library, and it contains uh, many different heretical books, and some of, been, some of them being these Gnostic Gospels. And so we're going to be exploring Gnosticism. And today we're taking a look at the secret Gospel of John. And there's just so much to say about Gnosticism that we are going to be diving into it and looking at it again with the lens of Hyperianism and see, seeing how it relates to everything that we talk about. But the big thing to understand about Gnosticism is where main, you know, mainstream Christianity talks about faith and repentance of sin and worshiping a God. You know, you sort of have this sin and repentance dichotomy. Whereas in Gnosticism, instead of talking about sin and, and repentance, they talked about knowledge and illusion. You needed to see past the illusion of matter, this illusory world that the Demirogos, Yaldabaoth, the evil god of the Bible created, and realize your own divinity through, not, through gnosis, through knowledge, and come to understand what you truly are. Uh, so, again, this is going to be a great talk. We have so much to talk about. There's so much depth here, so much to explore. So I hope you're ready. I'm really excited for it. Oh, once again, the Nag Hammadi Library, all the material from the Nag Hammadi Library can be read for free on gnosis.org, gnosis.org. So keep that in mind as well. And we are going to dive right into it. So prepare yourself for the most blasphemous and heretical banned book of the Bible, the secret gospel of John. So Gnosticism is an incredibly diverse system, and historians can't even really agree on what Gnosticism is exactly. And we're going to be doing more videos on different Gnostic influence systems, such as Valentinianism and uh, Manichaeism and all sorts of things like this. But the idea is that in the secret gospel of John, this is the book that lays out in the most full way the Gnostic idea of existence, where we are, why we're here, and what we need to do about it. And the secret gospel of John is written in such a way 
that it is a coded metaphor and an analogy and symbolism that you aren't supposed to take literally but look behind the story and see the coded knowledge, the hidden knowledge, the secret knowledge, the gnosis behind it. So keep that in mind. Another thing to notice about Gnosticism is that, and we'll see this when we look at other Gnostic texts, that it's uh, they're, they're not so concerned about being sticking to the same narrative. They might switch names around, switch different aspects of the story around. And the reason why they do this is, again, because it's a metaphoric, symbolic, coded system. And so the different characters and what they're doing don't really matter so much. It's what is behind it that's important. So this might seem very vague and abstract, but we're going to start reading it right now. And as we do, what I'm saying will make a lot more sense. So the secret gospel of John, another thing that I want to say about this is that this is mostly about the creation story, the creation of the world the emanation of the divine mind. And there are some historians that think Gnosticism is a lot older than Christianity. And some historians think that what happened was that Christians found the Gnostic story and then, and then added Christian elements to it to, to, to make it into something that would be Christian Gnosticism. And the reason why they think this is because if you look at this story in the secret gospel of John, it's put in the perspective of Jesus revealing to John these secrets. But if you look at it, it's basically an introduct introduction with Jesus talking to John, then it gets into the creation story, and then there's sort of intermissions with Jesus speaking to John and John asking questions, and then getting back to the story. So it's kind of, there's a lot of sort of interruption going on, so it almost seems like maybe these were added later. Maybe these Christian Jesus and John elements were added later. But this is all controversial. Historians don't agree on it. We are going to jump in to starting with the creation and the emanations of the one, the divine mind. We're going to skip a little bit of John speaking to Jesus because uh, there's nothing really too important there. But we can just see a little bit of it where Jesus is speaking to John. Be not afraid. I am with you always. I am the father, the mother, the son. I am the incorruptible purity. I have come to teach you about what is, about what was, and about what will be. In order for you to understand the invisible world and the world that is visible. So now we are going to talk about the inexpressible one. So this is going back to the very beginning. There's no earth. There's no material world. There is nothing. Absolutely nothing. There's no space. Okay, don't even think of terms in, of space and time. There's not even extension yet. And all we have is the one. And as we'll see, the one in some, in some translations is also called the monad. So depending on which translation you're reading, it'll be the one or the monad. So what is the one? Because that is all there is right now. But what is that? The one rules all. Nothing has authority over it. It is the God. It is the father of everyone. So there's nothing greater than it. 
Nothing has command over it. Nothing has power over it because it is all there is. It is the one, the invisible one over everything. It is uncontaminated, pure light. No eye can bear to look within. So let's take a look at this so far in terms of Hyperionism. Because in Hyperionism, what are we talking about here? This is the source. This is the source. And the source is a container of all frequency patterns. Now we're going to get to that in a moment. But I just want you to remember that in Hyperionism, this is a mathematical reality as expressed through sinusoidal waves, frequency, sine and cosine waves, which are light. So in Hyperionism, mind, thought, mathematics, sinusoids, frequency, light are all the same concept. We're just using different words, but they're all the same thing. So the source in Hyperionism is the domain of pure mind, pure frequency, pure light. So going back, the one rules all, nothing has authority, authority over it. It is uncontaminated, pure light. No eye can bear to look within. No eye can bear to look within because this is mind, pure mind. This is what you might call mental light. And uh, in my book, Ontological Mathematics, I actually call this inner light. So it's inner light. It is the light that cannot be seen. It's mind. Just like you can't see someone's thoughts. So this is the pure light no eye can bear to look within. The one is the invisible spirit. It's invisible. You can't see it with your biological senses. Now, it is not right to think of it as a god or as like god. It is more than just god. See, the Gnostics are already saying, I, I don't think of it as, as, as a god. Don't think of it as this anthropomorphic deity that lives in the sky with eyes and a body or that has wings or that lives in the clouds. Or they're basically saying any idea that you have of God, it's not that. It's more than that. Nothing is above it. Nothing rules it. Since everything exists within it, it does not exist within everything or it, it does not exist within anything so again in Hyperionism the source is all there is there's nothing outside of it because if there was something outside of it then it wouldn't be all there is there would be something else outside of it there's nothing outside of it because if there were there would be something other than it there isn't anything other than it Everything that exists must exist within it. Now, we haven't even gotten to the part where things start coming into existence yet, but kind of, you know, looking forward a bit. Everything that exists, exists within it because it is all there is. All that is, all that is. Since it is not dependent on anything, it is eternal. So, the one in Gnosticism, the monad, the great invisible spirit, the one, doesn't depend on anything. If the one depended on something, first of all, there would be something other than it. And it wouldn't be the ultimate thing because whatever it depended on, well, then that would be the ultimate thing. It depends on nothing. If it depended on something, there'd be something other than it and something more fundamental than it. 
It depends on, it doesn't depend on anything, it is eternal. How do we understand this in Hyperionism? In Hyperionism, the one, the source, the source singularity doesn't depend on anything because mathematically, since it contains both positive and negative values in equality, well, what's the result of all positive and all negative? It is zero. So mathematically, the source in Hyperionism, the singularity, the one in Hyperionism, is equal to zero. Mathematically, it is equal to zero, which means that it is nothingness. Now, it's a nothingness that contains everything. It's a nothing that contains, it's a zero that contains infinity. But because it's balanced via perfectly balanced positive and negative values, it is equal to zero and it is equal to nothingness. Now, nothingness is not dependent on anything. It's only dependent on itself. What's it dependent on? Well, the positive and negative values, but that's it, that's is what it is. So you can be dependent on, on, on itself, that's fine, because that's all there is. But it doesn't depend on anything external. There's nothing outside of it, there's nothing above it, there's nothing that it depends on. Zero logically must exist. You can't stop it from coming into existence. Remember, Hyperionism is all about logic and reason. This is a rational reality. Rationally, zero must exist. Its existence is mandatory. So, it is eternal. You can't prevent nothingness from existing. Nothingness is. Again, think about, think about going back before there was anything at all. What is there? Nothing. Nothing must exist. Even that simple thought experiment, nothingness must exist. And so it is eternal. It is not dependent on anything external and it logically must exist. So, since it is not dependent on anything, it is eternal. It is absolutely complete and so needs nothing. It has everything within it. Everything is contained. It has all, all it doesn't need anything. What could nothing possibly need? It doesn't need anything. It is utterly perfect light. The one is without boundaries. Nothing exists outside of it to border it. Well, that should be pretty self-explanatory. It's all there is, so there's nothing outside of it. Don't think of it like there's space and then it's sitting within space. No, there is no space yet. It's not sitting within everything. It is everything. It is everything. Remember, everything is nothing and nothing is everything. It is everything. There are no boundaries. Nothing exists outside of it to border it. The one cannot be investigated. Nothing exists apart from it to investigate it. Now, what does that mean by the one can't be investigated? What it basically means is that there's nothing external to the one that can investigate it. You can investigate it from within it. But the point here is that there's nothing, see, nothing exists apart from it to investigate it. There's nothing outside of it that can, you know, look at it and go, hey, what's that? No, no, that can't happen because there's nothing apart from it. You can investigate it from within it, but here's the crucial part. And this is a little preview. That means you are investigating yourself. Do you see the difference? You aren't outside of the one investigating it. Remember, everything exists within the one. So when you are within the one, you can investigate it, but you're investigating yourself. Are you starting to see this idea of gnosis, self-knowledge, know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. The one cannot be measured. Nothing exists external to it to measure it. You can't take a tape measure and, and measure it. It doesn't have any extension. It's pure mind. It's mental. There's no space. You can't, you can't measure it. You can't weigh it. It's mind. If, if you are talking to your friend, can you, can you measure their mind? No. Mind is not something that has extension. 
you can't there's nothing external you can't take a ruler and measure it when you're within it you can measure what is generated just like if, if your friend is sleeping on the couch and they're having a dream world there is a universe in their mind when you're outside of it can you measure their dream world no but when you're within it oh yeah it's as vast as a universe The one cannot be seen, for no one can envision it. The one is mind. Again, you can't see it with your external eyes, just like you can't, you know, the physical senses. The physical senses can't apprehend it, just like you can't apprehend your friend's dream. The one is eternal, for it exists forever. We already talked about this with regard to Hyperionism and nothingness being equivalent to zero. And by the way, I just want to point this out. I want to point out how in Gnosticism, do you see how these are just pure statements? And later we're going to see it, it, it gets turned into a mythology with characters. But do you see how in Hyperionism, we are using logic and reason to show why this is true? Right? The, the one cannot be seen. The one is eternal. And they're, they're just saying it. But do you see how in Hyperionism, we can show why this is true using logic, reason, and mathematics? It's very important, very, very important, uh, because we don't, you don't want to take anything on faith and anything on belief. But you can see already, I hope you're seeing that this system of Gnosticism is not like any faith you may have seen or heard. This is basically, it's a system of philosophy, really. What Gnosticism is, is philosophy put in the trappings of a, of a mythological story, a Christian story. It's a lot like Platonism, not exactly like Platonism. And Platonism, the Demiurgos, the creator, is benign. Here it's evil. But we'll talk about that later, I'm getting ahead of myself, because I'm very excited about Gnosticism. It's very cool. I hope you're getting excited too and seeing just how, how interesting this is already. Okay. But um, my, my, my point is here, I hope, I hope you're starting to see how, how, it's, how it's a philosophical system that's going to be clothed in a mythos, clothed in a story, but how we are already understanding it via the logic and reason and rational analysis and the mathematics of Hyperionism. So the one cannot be seen, you can't see it physically. The one is eternal for it exists forever. The one is inconceivable for no one can comprehend it. The one is indescribable for no one can put any words to it. And that's a very important point. The one is indescribable for no one can put any words to it. Human language is not what reality is. Reality is mathematics. It is frequency. It is mind. So the reason why words you can't put words to it is because that's not what it is. If reality were made out of words, then we could put words to it because we are using that, that which reality is. But reality isn't made of words. Reality is frequency. Reality is mathematics. So you can't put any words to it. It can only be described mathematically because mathematically, Ontological mathematics, frequency, frequency is the language of existence because that is what, what reality is. It's frequency. It's the pure mental light. And so we can describe the one, but only mathematically. So even everything me saying right now, all these words, these are approximations. The only thing that we can say that is true about it are mathematical statements. The one is infinite light, purity, holiness, stainless. And this idea about purity, holiness, and stainless, you know, this isn't any sort of moral statement. This is about perfection in that the way that mathematics is perfect, in that imagine a perfect computer code that contains no errors or bugs. So if you talk about a perfect computer code, you're not making any moral statement about the code. You're not saying that the code is good or bad or anything like that, but you're saying that it contains no errors, no bugs. It can never crash. The one is incomprehensible, perfectly free from corruption. Again, free from corruption, as I said. Not perfect. See, this is all in quotes now. Not perfect, 
not blessed, not divine, but superior to such concepts. It's basically saying everything that you have the idea of, of what perfect means or blessed means or divine means, it's beyond that. It's beyond that. Just like how I just described, it's not perfect as in a moral way, but in the way mathematics is perfect. And remember, when, when this was written for the audience that it was written to as well, they had certain ideas for what perfect means, what uh, blessed means, what divine means, and saying it's not these things, it's beyond, it's superior to these things. It's not, it's not what you think it is. Neither physical nor unphysical, neither immense nor infinitesimal. It is impossible to specify in quantity or quality, for it is beyond knowledge. Now, this is where there's a little bit of divergence, uh, but the, basically the idea here is that it is not beyond mathematical knowledge. We can know it in terms of frequency. We can know it in terms of mathematics. We can't know it in terms of some other route. And th th that's the Hyperion perspective, by the way. Uh, remember, we're looking at Gnosticism and then comparing it to Hyperionism. The one is not a being among other beings. It is vastly superior, but it is not superior. Again, it's just saying you can't put words to it. And the one not being a being among other beings, that should be apparent right now. It's not, it's not a being that's among others. It's not a god among gods. It is the source, the one, the monad, pure mind. It is outside of realms of being and time. For whatever is within realms of being was created. And whatever is within time had time allotted to it. The one receives nothing from anything. Now here we're talking about necessity and contingency in terms of Hyperionism and ontological mathematics. The one, the source, is necessary. Everything that exists within the holos, the realm of space and time, is contingent. Not necessary. Contingent. It depends on something else. So whatever exists within the realms of being was created, but it wasn't created out of nothing. As we'll say, it's going to be created from the one itself. So there's just a difference between necessity and contingency here. The realm of pure mind and the one is necessary. Things in, in the holos in space and time, like bodies, are contingent. Now what does that mean? It means they can pass away. Your body, your avatar, that's going to degrade, that's going to go to dust, that's going to pass away, that's going to break down. It was contingent. The one is necessary. It's eternal. It will always exist. But as we, you know, we aren't our bodies. What we truly are, in Hyperionism, we're monadic minds, eternal souls. In Gnosticism, we are shards of the One, as we'll see, sparks of divine light that inhabit and were imprisoned in bodies by an evil being. The One receives nothing from anything. It simply apprehends itself in its own perfect light. It's the realm of pure mind, the realm of being. The One is majestic. The One is measureless majesty, chief of all realms, producing all realms, light. Producing light, life. Producing life, blessedness. Producing blessedness, knowledge. Producing knowledge, good. Producing goodness, mercy. Producing mercy, generous producing generosity. It does not possess these things. It gives forth light beyond measure, beyond comprehension. Okay, let's break this down. And this is going to be important later as the one starts to emanate different aspects of itself. 
but what is what does it mean by say for example blessedness produces blessedness knowledge pro produces knowledge generous produces generosity but that it does not possess these things isn't that kind of strange well here we can understand this in terms of hegelianism so if we look at the philosopher hegel so what's being described right now in gnosticism is the one which is the divine mind in hyperionism this is the source singularity and in hegelianism this is what hegel would call the idea the logic so in hegelianism you have this realm that is a purely idealized realm it's just idea it's just reason it's just logic so you have different categories that are generated in this realm of idea such as being and nothing and becoming and something and other quantity quality cause effect so you have all these ideas all these categories being generated idea you know something other cause effect so when uh, the idea or the category or the concept of something and other exists as the concept it's not a something itself it's the concept of something let me give you an example you can have the concept of red without something actually being red so you can have the concept of something and the concept of other without actually there being a something and other again it's kind of like think of a, a video game code think of a code that has the code for something and a code for the other but it hasn't actually generated a game world yet with a something and with an other oh a tree and uh, and an apple a person and a cat see now these are, are spe specific instances so do you see within the idea within the divine mind you have these concepts but they're purely concepts that allow for these things to be generated but isn't these things itself so that's what it means by blessedness producing blessedness knowledge producing knowledge good producing goodness generous producing ge generosity but it does not possess these things this is the, the if anyone's familiar with platonism and the and the platonic realm of forms this is the 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 domain of forms you can think of it as well like a blueprint you can have a blueprint for a table but not the actual table but you need that idea you need the blueprint to build the table so when we're talking about the divine mind this is the realm of forms this is the realm of ideas this is the realm of blueprints patterns archetypes structures but that haven't materialized so again you could so this is what it means by knowledge producing knowledge good producing goodness mercy producing mercy generous pr producing generosity these are all the different conceptual conceptualizations the platonic domain of forms the blue the blueprints from which everything else will depend on and be manifest later it gives forth light beyond measure beyond comprehension his realm is eternal peaceful silent resting before everything he is the head of every realm sustaining each of them through goodness and uh remember again that this is you know so, sort of the parmenides eleatic idea of the realm of being it's just pure mind pure light pure 
In Hyperionism, the realm of pure frequency. It's the frequency domain, the source singularity. And again, by saying he, don't worry about gender. It's not actually masculine. By saying he's the head of every realm, it's 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 he's it's not an actual he or a being that's walking through. It's just mind. Remember, it's beyond your comprehension. With words, with words. And that's what the Gnostics say. And so it's important to realize, once again, because we're going to start getting into when, when these concepts start becoming characters. But remember, this is allegory, a coded metaphor. And all these characters that appear that might be doing certain things aren't actual, you know beings walking around with bodies and things like that, they are metaphorical symbols for philosophical concepts, things happening within the divine mind. That's, and this is ultimately, though, going to give rise to matter. So, we just read the inexpressible one. Now we're looking at the origin of reality. The Father, which is, so remember, the one in some translations called the monad, in, in, in Gnosticism is sometimes called the Father, it's sometimes called the Great Invisible Spirit, it's sometimes called the Virgin Spirit, so when, when they say the Father, they're talking about the source singularity, the one. But remember, don't think in terms about, of gender. I'm going to talk about this later and how talking in terms of gender here really annoys me. Now, Gnosticism, as we're going to see really soon, most likely, is very cool when it comes to androgyny. But still, people could misinterpret this sort of thing and think, oh man, well, the Father... You know, men must have a higher place. No, 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 no. Uh, I, you know, in 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 whether Gnostics thought that or not um, is debatable. I don't think they did because, as we're going to see, they seem to heavily influence androgyny. But when you get to some sects that were um, Gnostic influenced, such as the Valentinians and 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 other groups, it gets a little more blurry. I'm getting ahead of myself. There's so much I like. To, I want to say about Gnosticism that I'm very excited about it, and there's just so much. But but we're gonna we'll we'll do more. We're gonna do a lot of these videos. So if you got questions, if things don't seem clear, we're gonna get to it eventually. One thing that I want to mention here, though, before we we start with with this idea about the origin of reality, I want to talk a little bit about monism and dualism. I want you to notice that Gnosticism is a monism. Now, some people are going to think, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Gnost I thought Gnosticism was a dualism. Now, let me explain. Gnosticism is a monism, as described in the secret gospel of John. Everything comes from one thing. Monism essentially means there's one substance, one thing. Okay? Everything comes from the one. Everything is a part of the one. We are the one in Gnosticism. It's a monism. This monism generates a pseudo-dualism where there's, where there's Yaldabaoth, the evil archon ruler, which, which is the god of the Bible, by the way, spoiler, who generates the realm of matter and his servants, the archons. And then there's the... the so, so you do have this dualism of light and darkness. The, the realm of divine perfect light, and then the realm of darkness, which is the material world, which Yaldabaoth captures um, souls and, and, and traps them. But the idea is that even Yaldabaoth was generated from the one. So ultimately, it all collapses back into one, even this dualism. Yaldabaoth is not eternal, Yaldabaoth was generated from the one. At least the Yaldabaoth in his 
evil form is that specific entity. The divine, you know, the, the, the divine aspect is, is eternal. But my point is, is that all of us are emanations of the one, aspects of the one, parts of the divine mind that, as we'll see, goes insane and then fractures into independent pieces. But everything is part of the one. The, the dualism is a pseudo-dualism. It's not a real dualism. Now, some people also might be confused because there is another group called Manichaeism. And Manichaeism is highly influenced by Gnosticism, but it's also very different from Gnosticism in certain aspects. Manichaeism, there is an eternal Lord of Light and an eternal Lord of Darkness. And that's a true dualism because there are both these eternal entities, the eternal Lord of Light and the eternal Lord of Darkness that are basically in constant war with each other. And a lot of people consider they might lump in Manichaeism with Gnosticism because it has a lot of similarities. But there's a lot of differences as well. So I just want to make that clear. Gnosticism, as described in the Secret Gospel of John, is a monism that generates a pseudo-dualism, but not a true dualism. And, uh, but, but, but other groups that, that came later, such as Manichaeism, were true, were true dualisms because there were eternal aspects of, there were eternal light and dark forces. Here, the dark force is an emanation. And to bring things back to Hyperianism, in Hyperianism, Hyperianism is what you could call a monism because there's only one substance that is frequency, that is mind, that is the mathematics. But remember, we are also myriad monadic minds. But from the absolute perspective, there is one and many. Uh, I don't want to get too much into that now. I'm sure we can talk about that later as we continue because I want to get to the origin of reality. I don't want to get too much off track here. But, excuse me, in a nutshell, Hyperianism is a monism. But just remember that we are both one and many. We are the one from the ab absolute perspective, but we are also many monadic minds, individual minds, individual souls, individual monads. So, okay. We just talked about what the one is. In Gnosticism, it's also called the father, but don't get too hung up on the gender thing. The father is surrounded by light. He apprehends himself in that light, which is the pure spring of the water of life that sustains all realms. And I think that should be pretty easy to, to see. It's the pure spring of the water of life that sustains all, all realms. All realms are dependent on it. Just like in Hyperianism, everything is dependent on frequency. All space-time representations are dependent on the frequency domain. If you take away the frequency, well, the space-time goes away. So you have this pure, pure light, pure essence, that everything is going to be built from that. He is conscious of his image everywhere around him, perceiving his image in the spring of spirit, pouring forth from himself. He is enamored of the image he sees in the light water, the spring of pure light water enveloping him, uh, or enveloping him. And this is so cool. I love how it describes it as pure light water. Because look at how, even in ancient Gnosticism here, they're associating light with waves. And of course in Hyperionism, light, inner light, is frequency, which are sinusoidal waves. So I love this light water reference. So cool. Do you see how far Gnostics were very ahead of their time? Very intelligent, which is why, which is why it was the ultimate heresy for the church. My God, they hate knowledge, you know? Always you know, condemning the serpent as evil and all of this. Anyway, let's continue. So, pure light water. His self-aware thought came into being, appearing to him in the 
effulgence of his light. She stood before him. Okay, so now a being comes to existence. And what do what what is this really? Well, the the one is the divine mind. So what this basically just is is the first thought, the first concept of the divine mind. That's what this is. Okay? It's not an actual being walking around. It's not a she. It's not a it's it's the first concept, the first thought. It's nothing material. It's the first concept of the divine mind. And she stood before him. Remember, all allegorically. Then, this is the first of the powers prior to everything. So this is the first thought, the first concept prior to everything arising out of the mind of the Father. A divine mind producing the first concept, the first thought. The providence of everything, her light reflects his light. She is from his image, in his light, perfect in power, image of the invisible, perfect virgin spirit. Now, real quick, why do they call the one the virgin spirit? So there's the one, the monad, the father, the great invisible spirit, the virgin spirit. These are all different words for the same thing. This is the source singularity. The reason why they call it the virgin spirit is because it exists. It doesn't need anything to exist. It doesn't need to, and to produce, it doesn't need to, it doesn't need anything external to it to produce. Because in material terms, right, let's say you want to produce a child, well, you need to have intercourse with an other to create something. If you want to create something, you have intercourse with an other. But this is why they call it the virgin spirit, because it is going to produce, but it requires no other. Because remember, it is all there is. So all others are contained within it. And so it produces this first thought from itself, from itself. She is from his image in his light, perfect in power, image of the invisible, perfect virgin spirit. She is the initial power, glory of Barbelo, glorious among the realms, glory of revelation. She gave glory to the virgin spirit. She praised him for she arose from him. Now, this is the first thought. This is the spirit's image. This is the first thought. This is the first concept. Remember, nothing physical has been created yet. Here's something super, really interesting. She is the universal womb. She is before everything. She is mother, father, first man, Holy Spirit, thrice male, thrice powerful, thrice named, androgynous eternal realm, first to arise among the invisible realms. And this is so cool. This is why I want you to remember, don't get, get hung up on the gender thing, the he and the she. Because look, it's saying that this is androgynous. She is the mother father, first man, thrice male, thrice powerful, thrice named, androgynous, eternal realm, first to arise among the invisible realms. So it's a realm, it's a person, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a person, it's not a thing, it's a, it's a concept, it's a thought, it's, not, it's genderless, it's androgynous. And basically, what does it mean when they say thrice male, thrice powerful, thrice named, what's with the threes? In ancient times, when you would say thrice something, it's... You know, if you said, like, Hermes Trismegistus is, means Hermes the three times great. When you would say three times in ancient, in ancient times, it meant very or super. You know, if you're, if you're thrice great, it means you're super great or really great or very great. It emphasizes it. So to say thrice male, thrice powerful, thrice, it's very male, very powerful, um, very. It's the mother, father, androgynous, eternal realm. So we have, again, this is all androgyny. Think, think beyond gender here. 
she, Barbalo, asked the virgin spirit for foreknowledge. The spirit agreed. Foreknowledge came forth and stood by providence. This one came through the invisible virgin spirit's thought. Foreknowledge gave glory to the spirit and to Barbalo, the spirit's perfect power, for she was the reason that it had come into being. So, um, again, you're having, do you see how just concepts, these are just concepts. So when you're having things like, uh, you know, foreknowledge, and, and as we'll see things like goodness, Think in terms of Hegelianism, how you had, how you have being and becoming and something and other and cause and effect. So to say that, you know, foreknowledge came into being, it would, it would, it's kind of akin to saying cause and effect, not a cause and not an effect, but this the concept. But in ancient times, these are the concepts that they had to work with. You know, they didn't really talk in terms of the concepts or the categories that we have today. So they talked in terms of foreknowledge, good, goodness, wisdom. So when they're talking about foreknowledge, goodness, wisdom, it's like in Hegelianism talking about quantity, quality, cause, effect, something and other, being and nothing, determinacy. So these are all concepts, ideas. And see, we move on to this section that says primary structures of the divine mind. So this is still just the mind. This is the one stru structuring itself. See, we haven't even gotten into matter yet. We haven't even gotten to the generation of the world. We haven't. We're not even getting there. Right now, we're just in the realm. We're in the platonic realm of forms that is forming itself. That's getting all the blueprints ready. That's getting all the structures ready. In Hegelianism, this in in, in Hegelianism, you have the uh, the science of logic, the science of nature, and the science of spirit. This is the in Hegelianism. This is the science of logic. This is understanding the structure of the concept, the structure of the idea. And in Hyperionism, the structure of the singularity. Now, of course, in Hyperionism, we're much more mathematical about it. We're not generating foreknowledge and even things like cause and effect. Or we're, it's, it's pure frequency, pure mathematics that, that, that generates structure. But you can see in ancient times, this is very close. This is very close to what will eventually uh, formalize in he Hegelianism and then mathematically in Hyperianism and ontological mathematics. So this is the, fir the primary structure of the divine mind. She, the Barbelo, remember the Barbelo is the first thought, the first concept, asked the virgin spirit for incorruptibility. The spirit agreed. Incorruptibility came forth and stood by thought and foreknowledge. Incorruptibility gave glory to the invisible virgin spirit and to Barbelo, for she was the reason that it had come into being. She asked for everlasting life. The spirit agreed. Everlasting life came forth and they all stood together. They gave glory to the invisible spirit and to Barbelo, for she was the reason that it had come into being. She asked for truth. The spirit agreed. Truth came forth and they all stood together. They gave glory to the invisible spirit. And to Barbelo, for she was the reason that it had come into being. This is the fivefold realm of the Father. Now, again, don't get too hung up on the different words. These are structures and these are forms. Again, if you think about uh, Hegelianism, in Hegelianism, you basically just start with being and that you realize being is the same as nothing. Being and nothing sort of synthesize and give rise to becoming. Becoming gives rise to determinate being. And then from there, you know, you start going further and further and, and things give rise to something and other uh, quality and quantity cause and effect, and it's an unfoldment where different ideas arise from the other. And that's basically what ha what's happening here. But you know, in, in ancient times, we're talking about ideas such as 
truth and life and foreknowledge and all the ways that they, you know, they wouldn't be speaking in terms of, you know, being and becoming and determinacy and the categories and the concept the way Hegel does. So in the language that they had at the time, they're structuring the forms, the ideas, but in a story. And what we're doing here is we're really getting a glimpse and what the Gnostics wanted to do was get a glimpse in to know the mind of God. This is what's happening right now, to know the mind of God. And, you know, in contemporary Christianity, you can't know the mind of God. Knowing the mind of God is off limits or blasphemous. But this is why note this is why the Gnostics were all about if you attain secret knowledge. This was the secret knowledge of attaining knowledge of the divine mind of God. And as we, as we continue reading, we're going to see how this all unfolds. And, and we're ultimately going to realize that we are God that forgot because of a, a, a schizophrenic moment, you might say. So this is the fivefold realm of the Father, the first man, who is the image of the invisible spirit, who is providence, who is Barbelo, who is thought and foreknowledge, incorruptibility, life everlasting, truth. These, and then again, I love this. These are the are an androgynous fivefold realm. Therefore, it is a realm of ten of the Father. And uh, so it is an androgynous fivefold realm. Very cool. So as we're going to see later, why it says it's an androgynous fivefold realm, but it says it's also a realm of ten. How is how is it ten, but also fivefold? Well, we're going to see that all of these things are actually in pairs, and they're going to use t in terms of male and female pairs. But the but what what this means in terms of male and female pairs, it's going to be really the balance between positive and negative image. Uh, energy the balance between positive and negative energy but you use male and female as an atman and personally i don't like that okay i don't like using gender to represent that but that's what they do and 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 i completely see why and when they did it that was very ahead of their time and i'll get into why i don't really like it later because i just think it uh i don't like People who don't know that it's a story, I don't like them thinking that male and femaleness is what is true. I don't want to get in my head of myself because I'll go on a tangent and we've, I've been talking for a while and I really want to get to a certain part in this. But we'll come back to all this, okay? There's a lot. I just, I keep saying I'm really excited. So I'm really excited about Gnosticism and I want to talk about it, all of it right now. But that's impossible because it, it's it's such a complex and rich system. And I can't talk about all of it right now. Okay, so I just need to, we just need to keep going and it will all unfold, all right? So that was the first structure of the divine mind. Then we look at the secondary structure of the divine mind. And this is super cool. So now, the father looked into Barbelo. And remember, Barbelo is the first thought. So you have the father, the singularity, and the first concept, the first thought of the singular of, of the one is the Barbelo. So the father looked into the Barbelo, into the pure light surrounding the invisible spirit. Barbelo conceived and bore a spark of light, who had blessedness similar to but not equal to her blessedness, who was the only child of that mother father, the only offspring, the only begotten child of the pure light, the father. The invisible virgin spirit celebrated the light that had produced coming forth from the first power, who is the providence, Barbelo. Now again, this is very, very cool. The, we go back, the father looked into Barbelo, and when the father looked into Barbelo, it produces uh, the, the son, the offspring. That was so cool. The father looking into the Barbelo, 
that's self-reference. That's what that is. That's self-referentiality. That's what that represents. The father looking at the Barbelo, and from that gaze, a third thing is produced. That is self-reference. Do you see how it's kind of like you have a self and an other and the self gazing at the other, but the other is also itself. So you have self-reference. And then so that's a third thing in and of itself. So you have this very dialectical, this is extremely Hegelian. And this, if anyone, you know, I highly, you know, the Science of Logic is a, is a very complex book, but anyone with the philosophical trappings to do so, I highly recommend looking at how the Science of Logic, Hale's, Hegel's Science of Logic, is extremely similar to the unfoldment of the divine mind of the Gnostics. The unfoldment of the idea, the rational unfoldment of the idea is extremely similar to the enfoldment of the divine mind of the Gnostics, where you have the father looking at the Barbelo, giving birth to the son. This is ref ref self-reference. Anyway, it's just, I want people to recognize how intelligent the Gnostics were. And this is a very intricate system of philosophy clothed, secretly, hidden, wrapped up in a story. And we haven't even really gotten into the story part yet. This is all still very abstract, but we're going to start getting into the generation of Yaldabaoth and all this sort of thing. So the Spirit anointed him with goodness, making him perfect. Uh, he stood in the Spirit's presence, and it was poured upon him. Having received this anointing, anointing from the Spirit, he immediately glorified him, and he glorified the perfect providence because of her he had come into being. So you see how you had how the father that looks at, at the Barbelo, and from this self-referentiality comes the son, and now the son is, and these are still all just concepts, but then the son contains all the concepts, has similar concepts to the mother. You know, we have we're having um blessedness and, and providence, anointing him, which is which is giving him these structures as well. So he asked for mind to be a companion to him. The spirit consented. When the invisible spirit consented, mind came into, uh, came into being. It stood by the anointed and glorified the spirit and Barbelo. These beings came into existence through silence and thought. So again, this isn't anything physical. This is silence. This is thought. These are mental structures. These are mental structures. He wished to act through the word of the invisible spirit, whose will became an action and appeared with mind glorifying the light. And the word followed will into being. Everlasting life and will, mind and foreknowledge stood together. They glorified the invisible spirit and Barbelo. Because of her, they had come into being. So, I hope you can see sort of what's happening here. Is we have a structure of mind that's unfolding. You have the father and the Barbelo or the mother or the first thought of the father. Then you have self-reference giving birth to the, to the son. The son is this self-referentiality, self-reference. And then you have all these different structures being formed, such as will, mind, foreknowledge. You know, it's you know, think think of think of the concepts and structures of your own mind. You have will, you have thought, you have desire, you have all you know, all these different structures in your mind. And this is basically what's just it's you it's being described the unfoldment and the structure of thought itself. Because before you can even get to the creation of the world, well, you have to understand how the mental realm is constructed. Because this is a mental reality. This is a reality of mind. 
So, you know, while scientific materialists and things like that are so busy trying to figure out, oh, how, you know, this, the structure of matter, the Gnostics were, were like, hey, before you can talk about the structure of matter, you got to talk about the structure of mind. The Bible starts with the creation of the world. The Gnostics were like, hey, you can't start with the creation of the world. Where did that God come from? And what is the divine mind like? You got to start with the divine mind. So the Bible basically starts in the middle of the story. And the Bible, as the Gnostics viewed it, that creator God was an evil being. And we're going to see why, because we're going to see that the God of the Bible is actually a schizophrenic thought, a fractured portion, a shadowy evil thought of the divine mind. So I'm going to go through this part rather fast because I want to get to the birth of Yaldabaoth. This is the tertiary structures of the divine mind. And it's basically the same sort of thing. I'm going to go through it kind of fast because I think you get the idea. Uh, So the invisible spirit placed the divine autogenes uh, over everything, and 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 basically the, the sun is looked at as as like Christ. And but but remember, this is just a concept, just a thought. It's not like Jesus with his robe, and and no, this is the Gnostic idea of it. So it's just this self-referential thought that has a structure to it. All authorities were subordinate to him. The truth within him let him learn everything. He is called the highest of, name of all. The name will uh, be told only to those who are worthy to hear it from the light, from the incorruptibility, through a gift of the spirit. The four lights arising from the divine autogenes stood before him. The four fundamental powers are understanding, grace, perception, and consideration. So again, we're having still more, more unfoldments of understanding, grace, perception, consideration. And again, just think of it like cause and effect something and other. These are just pure concepts, pure categories, pure ideas. Understanding, perception, consideration, grace. You all have that as structures in your mind. These are just the unfoldments coming forth. But as you can say, as you can see, it's now becoming a story. Grace exists within the realm of light called Harmozel, the first angel along with Harmozel are grace, truth, and form. The second light is called Oriel, and it stands over the second realm. With Oriel are conceptualization, perception, and memory. The third light is called uh, Devaitai, and it stands over the third realm. With Devaitai are understanding, love, and idea. The fourth light is called Alelith, and it stands over the fourth realm. With Alelith are perception, peace, wisdom. Sophia. These are the four lights standing before uh, the divine sun. Twelve realms stand before the sun of the powerful. The sun, the Christ, through intention and grace of the invisible spirit. Twelve realms belong to the sun. Uh, from the perfect mind's foreknowledge, through the intention of the invisible spirit and the sun's will, the perfect human appeared, its first true manifestation. Okay. Now, this is really important. Basically, what just happened and what we went through really quick is it's we're still structuring the mind, but we're but in a mythos, we're associating angels with it. And and these angels and whatnot, again, they're not actual this th these are just putting angels to these concepts because we're putting it in a story form. And so again, you have things like perfection, peace, wisdom, understanding, love, idea, conceptualization, perception, memory. These are all still mental structures. But now, okay, it says, now of the construction, the perfect human appeared. Its first true manifestation, the virgin spirit named the human 
Adamus, Adam, Adam, Adamus, and placed him over the first realm with the mighty sun, with the first light, Harmozel and its powers. Now, I want to emphasize here that this first human isn't, isn't a material human. There's no body. It's just like, think about the blueprint of a human, but not even a human avatar or a human body, but like the mind, the, the, the mental structure. Not, not, not the brain structure, not a material structure, but just here is the perfect blueprint of the perfect mental structure of the human. It's going to contain understanding, conceptualization, love, wisdom, uh, grace, perception. So it's not an actual being, it's not a material, it's just the blueprint, the structure, the platonic form of human. The invisible one gave Adamus, see how it's, you know, like Adam, in, invincible power of mind. Adamus spoke, glorifies, glorifying and praising the invisible spirit. Everything has come into being from you. Everything will return to you. I will praise you and glorify you and the sun and the triple realm, father, mother, son, the perfect power. And again, the father, mother, son, this is like, again, it's that, that's just, it's nothing gods that you need to praise to. Father, mother, son is just self-thinking thought. You have father, which is mind. You have ma mother, which is the first thought of the father. And then you have the son, which is the, the father looking at or thinking about the thought, self-referentiality. So the son is self-thinking thought. So you have the father, which is like the mind just pure mind and then you have the mother which is the first concept and then you have the son which is self-thinking con conceptualization thought and then you had all the different structures that were generated and then this is all placed into a human not a body but a structure because as a structure the human is going to have all these different things. It's going to have mind. It's going to have a thought. It's going to have uh, self-reference. Self -reference, it's going to have conceptualization. It's going to have wisdom. It's going to have all these different things. So this is the blueprint that contains all these different aspects. Over the second realm was appointed Adamus's son, Seth, with the second light, Oriel. In the third realm was placed the children of Seth, with the third light, uh, Devaitai. The souls of the saints are placed here. In the fourth realm were placed the souls of the ignor uh, those ignorant of the fullness, those who did not repent at once, but who came after some time, eventually repented. They are with the fourth light, Elalith. All of these created beings glorify the invisible spirit. Okay, I know I went through that kind of quickly, but uh, I've been talking for a while here, and I want to answer your questions and chat with you guys. But now we are getting into the birth of Yaldabaoth, okay? A crisis that became the world. So it happened that the realm, Eon, Wisdom, Sophia. Now, so in Gnosticism, you have these divine beings and here's the thing. So this divine being is called wisdom, but it's also called, they're also called eons and they're called realms. So do you see how this is much more, this is an extremely philosophical system. This is not like mainstream Christianity where it's like, oh, and in the sky was the angel Michael and he had you know floating around you know, how, how, how it's sort of conceptualized no 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 here you have just this mental concept called wisdom which is an eon which is a realm which means it's a structure of the divine mind but we're we're gonna call it Sophia 
Because in our story that we're telling, in our story that we're telling, this structure, this eon, this realm, this concept of wisdom, we're going to call it Sophia. So what happened at the realm, the eon, the concept, wisdom, which is Sophia, of conceptual thought, epinoia, began to think for herself. She used thinking and the foreknowledge of the invisible spirit. Okay, here's where things start to get really interesting. So you have a thought of the divine, of, of the one, of the divine. Do you see how so far everything is happening in perfect harmony and perfect unity and perfect synchronization? But now you have a thought that began to think for herself. And, okay, the, 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 oh man, there's so much to unpack here. So I'm very excited. It's like unwrapping a present. I don't know where to start. <laughs> this is so cool. This is so cool. So you have a thought of the divine mind that begins to think for herself. And it uses thinking and foreknowledge of the invisible spirit. So it starts to use these generated structures, but for itself, rather than in harmony with everything else, for itself. And so you have a piece of the divine mind that starts to act independently on its own. And this is where the divine mind starts to go insane. Because think about it. If you have thoughts that start acting independently, you know, you start taking parts of yourself to be other than yourself, you know, that's, that, that's insanity. So you have here a structure of the divine mind that begins to utilize different structures such as thinking and foreknowledge but for itself rather than in in accordance with the wholeness and the unity and here's something i want to point out here there's so much to unpack here my god it's so cool so in Gnosticism, this is looked at as a very bad thing, as we're going to see. This is the this is going to lead to the birth of Yael the Beoth and all this sort of thing. So in, in Gnosticism, this is looked at a very bad thing. Now in Hyperionism, this should not be looked at as neither good nor bad. I'm going to explain why, but let me read a little bit further. So, Sophia wanted to think for herself. This is so cool. I really like this. And that's why I don't think it's a bad thing. In Gnosticism, it's a, it's a very bad thing. And I'm going to explain why it's not neither good nor bad in Hyperionism. But, so, she intended to reveal an image from herself. And to do so without the consent of the spirit who did not approve, without the thoughtful assistant of her masculine counterpart, who did not approve, without the invisible spirit's consent, without the foreknowledge of her partner, she brought into being. Okay, so basically, Sophia began to think independently and wanted to create something. And she did so without the consent of the one, which means like, you know, if you are, remember the, the one is, is a mind. It's a divine mind that acts in unity and in harmony. So thoughts need to have permission from the one, just like your thoughts should have permission. They shouldn't be all acting off by themselves. But as we know, they often do because we have the unconscious filled with archetypes. And that's why we're going to see that it's so cool. Gnosticism is 
psychoanalysis, it's depth psychology, it's Jungian integration, it's inner star actualization, but for the mind of God or the universe or reality or the all itself. So, you know, just as above, so below, just like we need to integrate all our thought, you know, selves, like the shadow self, the power self, and the mirror self to actualize our higher self, we're going to see uh, the divine mind needs to do so too, according to Gnosticism, because this is where you're having thought structures that are acting on their own volition without permission from the one. Again, this is like thought, thoughts acting on their own you know, if your thoughts started acting independently, that'd be no good. You'd, you, that, that would be a, a, a mental disorder. So, but there's another thing to, to so, so she acted, Sophia acted without permission from the one and without her male consort or counterpart. Now, what does this mean? Well, remember, I kind of skipped over this part real fast, but I, I did mention it, that when these structures were generated they were generated in pairs that's why it said um it is fivefold but also ten because each thing that's generated has a pair and, and there's a male female aspect to it because it's all androgynous and so there's a male female aspect to all this and the male female aspect is just an allegory they're not it's not actually gender it's an allegory for positive and negative. Because remember, everything balances to perfect zero. So everything is in perfect symmetry. Positive and negative is in, is in perfect balance. So now you have Sophia who acts without permission from the one, which is a thought acting in, on its own accord, and out of harmony without permission from its counterpart. It's not going to create in twos it's not going to create in, in symmetry, but it's going to create something asymmetrical. So this is going to result in ultimately, ultimately the birth of the material world. Not yet. We still have to bring Yaldabaoth into the picture, but ultimately this is the catalyst for all that. And in Hyperionism, we know that you ha this is the birth of the Big Bang. Where in the Big Bang, you have, you know, when we start off, all frequency, all mind is perfectly in phase and perfectly symmetrical. It is the breaking of symmetry. It is the sinusoidal waves going from in phase to out of phase, having non-orthogonal phase that results in the material realm, the Big Bang. So that's how we understand it in terms of Hyperionism. It is asymmetry occurring from the phase relations of sinusoidal waveforms. Now in Gnosticism, that translates to Sophia acting without her male counterpart. It's an asymmetrical, out of balance thought. And she brought, she wanted to create something, and she brought it into being. Now let me, we're going to, now Now this is the birth of Yaldabaoth. But I want to explain to you why, now the Gnostics looked at this as a terrible thing. This was the great error that must now, throughout history, be fixed. Now, here's why I want to show you that it's neither good nor bad. Because in Hyperionism, remember... That the one desires to be many and the many desires to be one. So right now, we are all are experiencing multiplicity. And we want to reach the omega point where unity, the realm of perfect light, the one, the absolute, all of it, everything is perfectly restored, perfectly actualized, divine perfection when we are one and it's ultimate bliss. But remember, if that would go on for eternity, that would be hell. You can't stay in perfect stasis, perfect unchangingness, perfect unity. If you were that way forever, it would become hell. 
So yes, it is, there is a breaking of unity. And, and, and from our perspective right now, that seems like a very bad thing since we're striving for unity. But once we reach unity and it's wonderful, once we exhaust all the beauty and divinity and, and, and you know, goodness from that, it's the breaking of symmetry that will save us from stasis and being locked in a state that would ultimately become hell. Because that perfect state, again, would ultimately become hell. So in Gnosticism, Sophia's actions are just, it, it's looked at it as, as a great error and something that is wrong. Now in Hyperianism, yes, it is the breaking of unity, but it's neither it's, it's from that perspective, it's neither good nor bad because yes, it is the destruction of unity. And in that sense, it's unfortunate, but it's also saving us from a state that would ultimately become hellish. And I talk about this a lot, how all of reality is the union of apparent contradictions. You know how nothing is everything, everything is nothing. And we have all the dialectics that we talk about of the union of opposites coming together. We are both one and many, many and one. So the breaking of, of, of this here, it's not good or bad. It is something that just occurs. It is a mathematical inevitability. It's built into the mathematical structure of reality. And from our subjective experience, it is a moment that will save us from being locked into, into eternal stasis. And you go from perfect unity and perfect conformity to manyness, multiplicity, individuality. And, and yeah, that's going to be hellish for a while. It really is. And we're going to have to journey, th you know, through that hell to return to unity. But the initial, the initial fracturing, you know, again, it's, it's a, it's a thing that occurs mathematically. And so one should not assign a moral judgment to it. So what I recommend that you do is, is, is take the stance that makes the most, that resonates with you the most. It can be looked at in so many different ways, the, the shattering of the one. It can, it can be looked at from the Gnostic view, oh, that it's a terrible error and a horrible thing. Or it can be looked at as, oh, it is God wanting to experience itself in multiplicity and having the joy of being able to do that. Or it can be looked at as, uh, it, well, there's so many different different ways to look at it. But really what it ultimately is, it's all these things at the same time. It's all of them at the same time. It's beyond words. It's both a mistake, but not a mistake. Because it's a saving from unity which would be hell if it weren't for that asymmetrical moment. So when you start to get to this point and really, I'm having, this is where it's very much beyond words. But anyway, I just want to continue here. Keep that in mind, that the breaking of symmetry, when we're telling a story, yeah, we can, we can tell it like it's this horrible thing that happened. We can talk about it as being the, the mind of God that goes insane. Or we can talk about it as uh, the mind of God that wants to know itself and love itself through multiplicity and is a beautiful thing. And it's all these things at once. It's beautiful. It's horrible. It's madness. And it's enlightenment. It's all of them together as one. And it seems like a contradiction, but when you look at the mathematics, it's not. So we're thrown into this journey of madness and absurdity and horror, but of beauty and love and wonder and knowledge. 
And I think you can just relate to that in your own life. Think about your own journey. You've had horrible moments, but you've had beautiful moments, and the horrible moments make the beautiful moments that much more beautiful. So it's all part of a process. Anyway, that's all to say, I don't condemn Sophia. I don't look at Sophia as, as, as making a mistake. It's something that occurs. It's part of the process, the mathematical process and journey that we are all on. But let's continue here. So basically, Sophia decided to act on her own. She started using the structures of the divine mind, thinking and foreknowledge. She began to think for herself. She did so without permission from the one. She's acting independently, and she's acting without her male consort. She's acting uh, a asymmetrically. And she wanted to create. So without the invisible spirit's consent, without knowledge of her partner, she brought it into being. Because she had unconquerable power, her thought was not unproductive. You see how... The divine mind started thinking things and bringing things into being. Well, now Sophia is going to think for herself and start bringing things into being. Something imperfect came out of her, different in appearance from her. Now, why was it imperfect? It's imperfect because she acted asymmetric and out of balance and out of harmony. Because she had created without her masculine counterpart, she gave rise to a misshapen being unlike herself. Remember, this is now the first time that something that has been brought forth that's out without permission from the one and asymmetrically. So this is an asymmetric thought, a dark thought, a shadowy thought. She gave rise to a misshapen being unlike herself. Sophia saw what her desire produced. It changed into the form of a dragon with a lion's head and eyes flashing lightning bolts. She cast him far from her. Outside of the realm of the immortal beings so they could not see him. Now what's happening here? This is an asymmetrical thought. And an asymmetrical thought cannot exist within the domain of symmetry. So this asymmetrical thought is cast out from the divine realm. She had created him in ignorance. Sophia surrounded him with a brilliant cloud, put a throne in the center of the cloud, so that no one would see it. Now this is outside of the divine realm. You're putting a throne in the center of the cloud. No one can see it there. Except for the Holy Spirit called the Mother of the Living. She named him Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth is the chief ruler. He took great power from his mother, left her, and moved away from his birthplace. He assumed command and created realms for himself will with a brilliant flame that continues to exist even now. Now is when we get into the darkness, the dark being, the shadowy creature has been brought forth, Yaldabaoth, this asymmetric thought. And now it's going to get really interesting as Yaldabaoth begins to create the material world as an inversion, a dark version of divine patterns, this malformed, grotesque, hellish world. And this is where things start to get extremely interesting. And what, just to recap here, what I, what I re really want to see is that we have now the divine mind that has unfolded into the different structures, things that you need for, for thinking, mind, uh, conceptuality, 
conceptualization, wisdom, thought, you know, thoughtfulness, foreknowledge, all these sort of things. And then you have Sophia who acts out of balance and from, from this asymmetrical thought, you have the birth of, of Yaldabaoth, this evil being. And for the Gnostics, this evil being, Yaldabaoth, is the god of the Bible. This is, is who they're going to associate with the god of the Bible. So you see, that's not the true god. The true god is the one, the great invisible spirit, the divine mind. Yaldabaoth is just God's shadow. Yaldabaoth is just a fractured, asymmetrical piece of God, but now you see how from the divine mind, from a thought beginning to act independently, the divine mind is now beginning to fracture because that from that independent thought, a new thought, a shadowy, a dark thought that was also an independent thought began birth. So now we're going to see all these independent thoughts are going to start to be born. All these independent thoughts are going to start to be born. And this is a mind that's now becoming divided against itself. Like, you know, imagine all your thoughts started as if they took lives of their own. And then, and then we're going to see that Yaldabaoth begins to create a material world. But this is all happening within the mind. So this is a dream world. The material world is a dream world that Yaldabaoth is going to construct. And again, this is another level of insanity because the beings that are going to inhabit that dream world are going to think that it's real. And this is how the divine mind loses sanity. Because imagine yourself. Imagine yourself. Imagine, you know, right now, you are, for the most part, let's not get into the unconscious and archetypes and all that. All right? Let's pretend that you're... Let's forget that for a moment. But you, you're a united mind. Your thoughts act the way you want them to. You think about what you want to. Imagine, though, that in your mind, your thoughts start taking on a life of their own. And then imagine those thoughts that take on a life of their own create a dream world. And then imagine that those thoughts that created the dream world took pieces of your mind and trapped them into the dream world and so that you thought it was the real world. That's insanity. That's you losing your mind. Your thoughts start acting on their own. You get thrown into a dream world and you don't even know that it's a dream world and you think that it's real. You are now, you know, you could imagine so, someone sort of been in a, in, be, being in a straitjacket in an insane asylum um, as as because they, they have fallen into a dream world that they take as real and all the thoughts are acting sort of independently. So that is what happened to the divine mind of God, which is us, because now bring it all around in terms of Hyperionism, here we are. Guess what? You are a monadic mind in the realm of matter, and this is a dream world, this is a mathematical dream world, and you, if you would but know it, are divine. And we are here as Hyperians to actualize and reintegrate and become aware of what we are as God, and then we will have all power to construct this dream world into whatever we so will. We can shape the material. We can have both the powers of the divine mind and the power of Yaldabaoth as well as creators. We aren't just, see that's the thing about Abraxas. It's both light and shadow. It's both, it's the source and the holos. So we have the divine mind and we can create on divine realms and we can also create dream worlds for us to experience. It's everything. It's all. And so we have all these powers and this dream world is the realm that we are now in and that you have forgotten that you are a part of the absolute, the one. We are all monadic minds. We are all nodes in the neural network of the one, the universe. 
The one isn't anything apart from us. It is what we are. We are the creators and the destroyers. We are everything. We are the divine mind. We are Sophia. We are Yaldabaoth. We are the Barbalo. We are everything. We are the all. There is nothing that is not us. There is nothing outside of us. There is nothing that we cannot reach. We are not bounded by anything. We are boundless. We have no boundaries. We are everything. And we can tap into that power when we remember, have gnosis, remember what we are. And in Hyperionism, we show how this is possible by understanding the true nature of reality through logic, reason, and mathematics. Because these stories are awesome. They're really cool. They're great. They're so amazing. But we don't want to learn just through story because who's to say whether this is true or not? This could be just some idea someone came up with and, and wrapped a story around. Who's to say what's true, what isn't? But this is why we use logic, reason, and mathematics to truly understand all of this. And this is why we can understand the source singularity as the frequency domain. And we can understand ourselves as nodes within the absolute. And we can understand the holos as being generated through Fourier mathematics. Because through frequencies, we can use the Fourier transform to create space-time representations. And we can understand mind and matter in terms of the Fourier transform and ontological mathematics. We can use logic and reason to see what is true, to see what is re re what reality is, and have true knowledge and see beyond story and see beyond metaphor. Even though these stories and metaphors are super cool and I'm not discounting how amazing that are that is I'm just saying we can understand them with the rigor that say physics studies the material world ontological mathematics and Hyperionism goes even w infinitely beyond that to have true knowledge of the immaterial domain just like the Gnostics wanted to have knowledge of the divine mind of God we as Hyperians through our knowledge through our mathematics can have knowledge of what exists is truly ultimately what we are and with that divine knowledge of what reality is what existence is through that mathematical power through that mathematical knowledge through that mathematical understanding we can have power over the material realm we can have power over everything because everything is a manifestation of what we are and knowledge is power so my friends, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I am going to jump into the chat and answer questions. We are going to continue next time. Uh, make sure that you stay tuned, stay subscribed, uh, have notifications turned on because we are going to talk about... Uh, we, we're now just getting into the good part where Yaldabaoth comes into the scene and the Archons arise and the, the, the creating of the hellish world and throwing humans into matter and trapping the divine... It gets good. It's really good. And I'm so fucking excited. I hope you can I hope you can tell. This stuff is so uh, cool to me and I love it. So make sure um, you're there for the next one because we are just getting started. It's going to be get so good. Um, and also I'm again, I'm going to jump into the comments right now and hang out with you guys and answer questions. So by the way, um, make sure that you do have notifications turned on because if you're watching the replay of this, you get all the all the uh, important parts, but you miss the Q&A and a lot of stuff that happens. So make sure you try and join us when we're actually live so that you can see all the Q&A and, and, and the interesting pieces that, that you may miss. So um, yeah, I'm going to jump to the comments right now with you guys and stay tuned for next time. We are going to be looking into uh, Yal Debeoth and the creation of the material world, the entrapment of humanity, the creation of the Archons, and so much more. I want to give a shout out to all the supporters on Patreon. Especially White Rabbit, John, Susan, Jiwan, and everyone who supports. You guys are amazing. Uh, you're, a you're exactly why I am able to do what I do. If you enjoy my work, consider supporting on Patreon. Because like I said, there's a lot of censorship on Facebook and YouTube. Case in point, my recent video got shadow banned on Facebook and it's awful. It's really annoying. So Patreon ensures that I'm able to continue to create even if YouTube or Facebook or whatever ever pulls my channel because who knows. So I appreciate all you guys on Patreon. It means the world to me and you get access to our weekly secret live streams.